All right, so let's go ahead and do a little bit of uh, investigative methodology on this machine that we uh, infected with the rootkit uh, in the previous video. So we're just going to do some common admin uh, investigative things. So first off, you know, we look here in Task Manager. We don't see anything that really looks out of the ordinary here. All right, so if we do task list, we see that there's nothing, uh, you know, going on there. And this is just like going to task manager processes. But, you know, you can, you know, do things like find string and stuff like that as well. So now here's, that should be an indication that something's wrong. When I did find string hxdef, notice the command prompt just went away. Now, we can do other things as well. Let's see if we can find uh, NC. Now, keep in mind, I just wanted to show you that behavior because, you know, why would the investigator or the person that thinks they're infected even be looking for netcat or hxdef? They wouldn't even know that. But I wanted to show you that that's one of the behaviors, you know, one of the weird things that could happen uh, when you're looking for stuff on the machine. So that should be some indication that something's wrong. Uh, if you look for certain things and, and the command prompt disappears, for example. Now let's go ahead and look at Process Explorer because it gives us a little more detail than Task Manager does. And even in Process Explorer, you know, everything looks to be okay. There's no evidence of the Hacker Defender Rootkit. There's no evidence of Netcat listening. So again, an administrator or even, a, you know, a entry-level person doing live forensics, you know, they're really not finding, they're not going to find much. Now we're going to do netstat-an. We can see there's nothing listening on port 100, which we know from the previous video that there is netcat listening on port 100 because we were able to tell net into it and get a command prompt. So there's nothing on 100. Netstat shows us nothing. All right, so that pretty much shows us that. Now we're going to do SC query here. And basically what SC query is, is it shows you all of the services, status of all the services that are currently running. Now, obviously that's too much to display. So let's write it out to a text file named query.txt so we can actually look at it. All right, so and here it is. So what we see here is we can see all the running services and notice none of these services actually show anything related to anything being per se wrong. You have to ignore the black flashing there. I got some little bit of weirdness going on with my recorder. So you can see IS admin and other services, but nothing out of the ordinary here. All right, so that kind of tells us is there's nothing there. There's nothing weird going on. So, you know, it puts us in a position to where now we look at TCP view and we see still there's nothing there. There's, there's nothing weird going on. All of these things are normal services listening on normal ports. So again, we can see there's nothing that's really uh, would make us say, oh, something's not right here. Now you can see the time wait connections down there from, uh, you know, previous times that I connected from my Linux box. But that doesn't really, that, that's only there because we just previously connected. Uh, if it had been any extended amount of time, you wouldn't see those. All right. So, you know, doing all of those normal things really doesn't show us anything. But let's take a step back for one second and go back to our command prompt here. And let's write 
the nets that out to a text file as well. And let's read that. Not net hood, net stat. There we go. Again, no 100. You know, we could search for 100 uh, if this were a bigger net stat output. And we could see there's nothing there. Now let's go over to our Linux box here and let's look at this machine from the outside, all right? And the first thing I'm going to do is scan it. And I'm going to tell Nmap to just do a TCP connect scan. And I want to basically look at every port. So that's from 1 to 65, 535. And you do need to tell Nmap that because by default, it's only going to scan, uh, you know, the first 1400 or so common ports. Now we can see, look right here, we can see that there is indeed something listening on port 100 right there. So even, now let's, you know, Netstat told us something different than that, remember? When we did Netstat on the actual victim machine, it told us that there is nothing listening on port 100. And looking here, we can see that there is indeed something listening on port 100. So now we've got a conflict here between, uh, you know, what Nmap is telling us externally and what Netstat told us locally on the machine. So that should be one clue that something's not right. You know, if you look at the machine remotely or from another machine and you see ports and services that you don't see locally, you know something's, something's not right. Something's being hidden from you. So let's go back and let's do that comparison once more. All right. No port 100. Nothing listing on 100. All right. Something is listing on 100. So who's right? Is Nmap right? remotely or is Netstat right locally? Now, your instinct would typically tell you as an admin that what's right is probably what's on a local machine, but let's just tell Net to that port. This is a common enumeration or discovery technique. Well, if we tell Net to that port, we see we get a command prompt. All right, what that tells us is something that somebody has a back door on that machine because when we tell Net to that port, we instantly get a shell. No login, no nothing. So we know there's a back door there. It's listing on port 100. Now what this is going to do for you, and again, see it's nothing on 100 per net stat, is when you do get the hard drive and you do forensics, we're, we're getting stuff that we're able to actually look for. So if we do a fine string for 100 on that IP, so let's do the IP and then colon 100. Oh, excuse wrong port there. Let's do that again. All right, and I'm just doing a fine string. There's it see it disappears on us. So remember, the rootkit is hiding port 100, so that behavior is normal. Now, again, once more nothing on 100 we see that per net stat. We are able to tell net into port 100. So net stat is really at this point, you have to understand that we can't trust whatever, anything the local machine tells us. That's essentially one thing that we have to learn about rootkits is if you think the machine's been rootkitted or you think it's been infected with a Trojan of this magnitude, you can't trust anything that the machine tells you about itself. You can't. This is why our remote sessions with Nmap is going to be more reliable. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get Snort from my TFTP server, and we're going to run Snort on this machine. And again, this is open source free. I haven't had you spend any money here. And I'm just going to install it. And then I'm going to actually... Um, well, actually, I'll do dash W so we can see which interface we need to listen on. Interface 2, that's the, the accelerated uh, VMware interface. So I'm going to basically essentially tell Snort to listen on that interface. Now, again, the reason I'm showing you this is because even though port 100 is being hidden from the OS, let's see what happens with Snort when we tell it to raw, log raw packets 
and see if it can see anything on port 100. So we're going to tell it to listen on I2, and I want to write that to a file. So I'm just going to call it uh, listen.txt for now. All right, so Snort's running. Now let's go back and tell Nets that port again and see if Snort picks that up. Good. So we're in. Uh, we can do things. We, you know, we got our shell prompt again, or our command prompt. But we can see now. Here's what's interesting. Notice we can see all the HXDef stuff when we're telnetted in. Remember, telnet, this is a Linux emulated shell. This is not a real Windows shell here. So with that being said, these things are not hidden from this remote Linux emulated version of the Windows command line. So there's another hint for you. You know, again, looking at stuff remotely sometimes can show you things that you can never see looking at it locally. Now, again, if we did a directory on the machine here, we don't see any of that HX def stuff. Now, part of the reason I did this is I want forensics people to understand, look, you got to move past being able to find stuff on the hard drive because that's it requires a lot more than that now, especially if you're going to be investigating things like attacks, compromises, data loss, and stuff like that. Um, you you got to be able to do some of these things. You got to understand a little bit about networks. Now, if we go to INET Pub, remember we couldn't see that mypage.html, but guess what? Now we can see it. It's right there. So we're basically using the back door that the attacker put there. And we can see things we can't see locally on the machine. So to all the forensics people out there, learn some networking, learn some protocols. Now I'm just simply going to take this page and bring it over to my Linux box. Well, looks like our shell hung up on us there. So let's just bring that back up and do it again. All right, so let's get back in there. All right, and, and this time we will TFTP it to the proper IP address, which my Linux is actually 112. So we can see that my page is there, and what I was going to do is just TFTP it over to our Linux box. So we could look at it, you know, somewhat safely. I, I did the wrong IP again, it's 112. Duh. All right, so now, you know, we can somewhat safely look at it in our Linux virtual environment here. So let's go ahead and fire up Firefox and look at that actual file. Or actually, let's just cat it to start with. So if we cat that page that we just bought over, guess what? We can see that it's the home page, but look at this iframe. Now, if we were investigating this, we might want to say, okay, well, what the heck's at 112? And then maybe we browse 112, and then you discover that there is an exploit page there. So that should tell us something. Now, again, when we're looking at this HXDEF, we need to get these over because now we should make some type of assumption that this is probably, um, and we can see Netcat, let's, we'll put that there too. And then we'll get the, the uh, rootkit stuff because even if you didn't know what HXDEF100.exe and I and I was, if you Googled it, you'd immediately find that it's a rootkit. But let's say we did, and now we want to bring this kit over and analyze it, or at least look to see what's going on with it. So we get both of those over, get the XC first, and now we'll get the INI. &I. All right. And now we're going to actually take a look at those. Now, again, we're playing the role of an investigator now, not the hacker anymore. We're, we're investigating this. 
So if we read that file, look at all of this. So now some things should start to make sense to us as we scroll through and actually study this INI file. For example, there's a tag there, hidden ports, and look at what ports is hiding. Okay, well now you should say, okay, that's why. And you can see netcat listening on that port. This is why we had something listening on port 100 and we couldn't see it. We can also now see why we're able to browse to that page and see it. However, we're not able to see that page when we actually go to that machine and look in the INET pub directory because we can see that it's hidden from everything except for W3WP and just and I just I'm going out to Google here and Googling that to show you we can see here what W3WP is. It's an IIS application pool process. So even if you didn't know what it was showing the hidden stuff to, you go out and look at it and you see, oh, this is what serves the actual web page out. So that would make sense that you can see the page if you browse there because this one service on the machine is allowed to see it, but nothing else is. This is why we couldn't see it in Explorer and all the other ways we were trying to find stuff on the, on the actual victim. Now, our command.exe is another process, a program that can actually see stuff. And what this is, is just a copy of command.exe rename. Now, these are all the things that are being hidden. Now, I do want to just say to those of you that are new to investigating things like this, one of the things you always have to remember with rootkits is one of the things you need to be concerned about first off, one of the first things, is not so much what the rootkit is actually doing, but what is it hiding from you? You need to try to figure that out first. And I just, you know, we can see what uh, our command, we can see, you know, as I scrolled down earlier, service name, what the service is being displayed as. And the fact that we saw that the service is being displayed, and I just highlighted that a second ago, we should now be able to try to stop that service by its display name. Now, again, when this command line is to do that, let's stop Snort here and look at, see what Snort's able to tell us. So what are we looking for? Well, what was hidden from us? Port 100. Let's see if uh, port 100 shows up here. Look at that. We get some hits. We can see that there's connection to port 100. So again, from the system side, everything's hidden, but from the network side, not so much. We can see port 100 all through here. So if we had Snort running, you know, when the attacker connected, we might be able to see wh who he is and where he's connecting from. Now, again, I just want to point this out in the INI again. With our command, we should be able to see things because it's showing that these processes are able to see things. That's what, that's why we have it on the root processes here. So W3PWP can see things, so can our command.exe. So if we were to go to look for that, we don't see it there. Well, let's go to Windows System 32. And you could spend a lot of time searching, but we're just going to go there. Our command.exe is there. Let's run that. What is it? It's just another version of command.exe. Now, we exit and we go back to regular command.exe. So if I were to go to Documents and Settings, Administrator, Desktop, Notice, all we see is this stuff. But now I'm going to go to back to System32 and run our command again, which is the pretty much the attacker's hook to where you can see his own stuff. And I go back to Documents and Settings, Administrator, Desktop. We can now see a folder that we didn't see before named hxdef. right there. So if I change that folder to see what's in there, there's all of the kit stuff. Now again, we couldn't have come to any of these conclusions without 
looking at this machine remotely first, and here's the I and I stuff that we copied over that we examined. And this is what allows us to be able to investigate at this level. Now, you know, again, guys, I need you to understand that forensics is taking on a new avenue. And all I'm doing is stopping that service because I read the I and I and it said the service name was HXDEF Service 100. So let's put that in quotes and see if it responds, Windows responds to stopping that service, which is what we see right there. Now, again, where I got that is if we go back and look at the I and I here, it shows us that that's the display name for the service. So we net stop that. Now, keep in mind, you would have to spend probably some hours researching this kit, you know, trying to figure out how it works and things like that before you know to, to stop it with this service name because you'd have to actually figure out by reading the readme or studying the kit you know what the display name means to the kit but we can see it says it stopped all right and now with that stopped and we go to task manager again we're going to see stuff that we didn't see before we stopped it like for example netcat right there it's running we couldn't see that before but since we stopped the kit now we can All right, we can also now, from our C drive, without going in to do anything special, when we run NetStat, now we see that there is something indeed listening on port 100 as soon as I find it. Uh, let's see. Oh, there we go. It's right there. So, yeah, something is listening on port 100. So now, you know, Windows is, tell we can, Windows is telling us the truth Simply because we stopped the kit, there's no other reason. With, with that kit running, you wouldn't be able to see any of that. And even on uh, TCP view here, we can see Netcat listening right there on port 100. Now, you know, I say this a lot. I've said it before. But you guys that do forensics... This is kind of like the, some, some of my ways of relaying to you and giving you my opinion, and it is just my opinion, that if you're doing forensics, you really got to learn a little bit about networks, how networks work. You got to learn a little bit about protocols, how things are transferred from one place to the other. Additionally, those of you that are pen testers, you got to know a little bit about forensics because when we get to things like covering your tracks, anti-forensics, anti-incident response. Well, how you can't really do anti-forensics if you don't really understand a little bit about forensics, at least. You can't do anti-incident response if you don't really understand the process that goes into an incident response situation. So part of this video, the first part was just to really uh, get you a little bit deeper into some of the post-exploitation stuff. Some just some interesting things, and we're going to expand on this a lot more. Uh, we're, we're probably going to make this into a whole series of probably 10 videos. Um, one of the things I want to do next is I want to take this HXDEF Hacker Defender Rootkit. Again, it's a known rootkit, but, you know, we do have to exercise some responsibility here and not put uh, stuff out here that could, you know, get somebody in a lot of trouble real fast. But what we're going to do with this is we're going to take the HXDEF rootkit, we're going to take that executable, we're going to throw it in the Ali, throw it in the IDA Pro, and we're going to reverse it a little bit and try to figure out exactly what it's doing. Now, there's documentation that can tell us, but I think it'll be more fun if we uh, break this thing open, unpack it, and actually try to figure out what it's doing on our own. You'll understand it better, and you'll understand when you see other malicious programs that do similar things, and you'll know kind of where to start. So hopefully you guys got a little bit out of this and gave you some more ideas on some things that could be done. And um, I'll look forward to seeing you later when we break this kit down in Ali or Ida Pro. And we'll probably do it in both because I know uh, some of you swear by Ida, some of you swear by Ali. So we'll kind of probably just kind of do a breakdown of it in both of those 
to let you see what the process would look like. Thanks for watching.